Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning, as uh, we gather in these two places, and we pray for those who uh, are watching through the, the live stream, we ask, Father, that in your mercy, you might speak your word to us. We pray that you might encourage us, show us the greatness of your salvation and the greatness of our Saviour, and grant to us such an understanding of that, that we live in the joy that you give to your people this day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, Would you turn with me once more to Matthew chapter 19, and this time to verse 13, and I'd like to read to you from there. Then they brought little children to him in order that he might put his hands on them and pray for them, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And once he had laid his hands on them, he went away from there. And then a man came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask about a good thing? Only one is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, Which ones? And Jesus said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And on hearing the word... The young man went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, the wealthy enter the kingdom of heaven with great difficulty. Again I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Having heard this, the disciples were greatly disturbed and said, Who then can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, This is impossible for men, but all things are possible with God. Then Peter answered and said to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also be seated on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And all who leave houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for the sake of my name will receive 100-fold and inherit eternal life. And many who are first will be last and the last first. This morning as we return to Matthew's Gospel, we're confronted by two encounters with Jesus. Two encounters with Jesus which really couldn't be more different. The children brought to Jesus and the young man who comes to Jesus under his own steam. The simple expectation that Jesus might do something for these children and the bold assumption that there was something that this man could do to secure eternal life for himself. The children who were welcomed and the man who went away deeply grieving because in the end he could not do what was asked of him the empty hands and the hands too tightly grasping what he already had. They're familiar stories, yet when we pay attention to them, we find ourselves face to face with the character of Jesus and the salvation he offers. And we're warned of obstacles that we are too prone to construct for ourselves and for others. The simple act of bringing the children turns out to be more profound than you and I might ever have imagined, and a me-centred approach even to salvation is much more tragic and destructive than we could ever have thought. There are traps that we too can fall into, like the disciples did that day, like the young man did. So you need to keep your wits about you as we look a little closer this morning. Let's look at both of the encounters in turn. The first encounter, the children. The first encounter was with the children that were brought to Jesus that day. 
Presumably they were brought by their parents. We don't have to presume what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to touch their children and to pray for them. They wanted their children to have a direct and personal connection of some kind with Jesus. They knew that Jesus touching their children was no empty gesture and his praying for them was more than words just spoken into the air. They wanted Jesus to claim these little lives. And it's entirely understandable, isn't it? Those of us with children will know that uh, the thing we want most for them is that they might know Jesus for themselves. That they might trust him and receive life from him. We want our children to delight in Jesus and to walk carefully with him as his disciples all the way until Jesus returns. Most of us who are parents have at one time or other prayed that our children would never know a day when they did not know and love the Lord Jesus, trust him and walk with him. And so it can be a source of very great anxiety for parents as they watch their children distance themselves from faith and from Jesus. That's not what we want for our children. We know where life is and we long for them to have that life, the life only Jesus can give. We've taught them and we've prayed for them and we've sought to model for them what it means to live as forgiven people. And if they walk away, even for just a little while, we turn desperately to God and ask him to seek out this lost sheep and bring them home. Because it matters. Because every singular life matters. I have a list of the children of my friends for whom I pray daily. Each of them grew up in a Christian home, but at this particular point in time, none of them walk with Jesus. And I know the distress that that causes their parents, because with them I know that the only hope for these dearly loved ones is the very person they refuse to countenance just at this moment, the one who gave his life for them so that they might have life. Only he can save them. After all, he came to seek and save what is lost. And so I pray. I pray that God might do what only he can do and bring those lost sheep home. And perhaps you know, children, at this moment, friends, family members, you know people who have grown up in the faith but have wandered away. And I want to say to you, don't give up on them. Every single life matters. Don't stop praying for them. The parents that day wanted what only Jesus could give their children. So they brought them to him. But that is when the oddest thing happens. The disciples rebuke them. Now, why? Why did they do that, do you think? What possible reason could the disciples have for standing in the way of these parents bringing these children to this saviour. Perhaps it was because they saw them as a distraction. Children in the first century might be loved, uh, but they weren't allowed to interrupt the important things of life. They weren't supposed to get in the way of the things that really mattered. Perhaps the disciples believed that they understood what mattered most to Jesus. Had he told them that his mission was to seek out the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to call them back home, to proclaim a message to men and women who could respond with repentance and faith? Wasn't he heading to Jerusalem, expecting a frightening confrontation with the religious authorities there? He didn't have time for this. It just wasn't that important. Now consider who the them are who are rebuked by the disciples. It's not the children. The disciples didn't rebuke the children for being brought. No, it's the parents. As far as the disciples were concerned, the parents shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be presuming upon Jesus' mercy and generosity, taking up his time like this. They were getting in the way of the things that matter. Those parents just haven't understood Jesus and his mission. 
It's almost as if the disciples believed these children were outside of Jesus' mission, beyond the saving reach of Jesus. After all, they couldn't repent and believe, could they, at this age? They couldn't have real faith. They couldn't confess Jesus as Lord, not audibly, not articulately. And unless they can do those things in a manner that we can recognise, bringing them to Jesus is just a needless interruption to the mission, isn't it? Let them come back later, in a few years' time perhaps, when they can come under their own steam, confess their own faith, not needing to be brought by others. But, friends, as marginal as these children might have seemed to the disciples, they were not marginal to Jesus. What might have looked like a trivial distraction was meaningful to him. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, Jesus said. Don't get in their way. Don't write them off as of little importance. They matter. Their helplessness is, in fact, a model of all true faith. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. They bring nothing to the table. They are unable of taking even the first faltering step to Jesus. They're brought by another. But that's what salvation is always like. That's the astonishing wonder of it. Unable to come... I was brought to Jesus. The Spirit did his great invisible work in me and I was brought to Jesus. That's why the disciples must not stand in the way of those who brought their children to Jesus. Because while these children cannot do anything themselves, they are not beyond the reach of Jesus. It's no surprise then uh, that in the 16th century, when Archbishop Thomas Cramner was drafting the Book of Common Prayer service for baptism, he constructed it around not the usual passages that people went to to justify the baptising of infants, but this one, or at least it's parallel in Mark's Gospel. He knew this wasn't a passage directly about baptism. There's a better theologian and exegete than that. But he knew that this passage teaches something us teaches us something very important about the heart of our salvation and so about the heart of Jesus. Peel back all our rhetoric and every expectation and at the heart of it, our salvation is about helpless sinners saved by grace. And if you grasp that and delight in that, the direction of the whole thing is entirely the opposite of the impression we sometimes give. I did not find Jesus, Jesus found me. The first and crucial decision was not my decision for Jesus, but his decision for me. A helpless sinner saved by grace, brought to Jesus when I could not come myself. And Jesus' welcoming of children is a marvellous picture of that. Don't you dare get in the way of these children being brought to me, Jesus was saying. Let them come. This is not a distraction. Can't you see this is what it is all about? The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's always a miracle when someone is saved. It's never something ordinary, something natural or to be expected, something we can achieve or acquire. It always begins with God reaching out to us in Jesus, not us reaching out to him. And that point is driven home by the the contrast with the little scene, uh, of this little scene with the one that follows. So the second encounter, the rich young ruler. The man that came to Jesus after he'd left the children is so unlike them. He apparently sought Jesus out. He knew what Jesus was offering. And he wanted it. We're going to learn in a moment that he was rich and he was young. And Luke's account will tell us he was a ruler. The rich, young ruler. He was used to getting what he wanted. There was no obstacle he could not find his way around. He was certainly not helpless. He didn't need anyone's help. 
If he knew where something was and he wanted it, he would seek it out and acquire it. So he came to Jesus. And at least that's a good thing, isn't it? If he was interested in eternal life, at least he came to the right person. But three things about his initial question reveal there's something more going on in this man's heart. Did you notice? He addresses Jesus as teacher. Up to now in this gospel, every time Jesus is addressed as teacher, it's by someone who has a heart problem. In Matthew 8, it's the scribe who rashly declares that he'll follow Jesus wherever he's going, and he's not the slightest idea of what this will involve. In Matthew 12, it's the scribe and Pharisees who come demanding a sign. Later, the disciples of the Pharisees, along with the Herodians, will come to Jesus in chapter 22, trying to trap him with their question about taxes, and they'll address him, teacher. And in the same chapter, the Sadducees will do the same as they try to trick him about the resurrection. Starting off by simply calling Jesus teacher is a warning signal from the start. And then his question, what good thing will I do to have eternal life? See, he's very much in the driver's seat. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm used to doing things. I get things done. I'm good at getting things done. And then I'll have eternal life. He can add that to what he already has. It's not as positive an approach as it might first appear, is it? Jesus actually picks up on one other thing in his question. What good thing will I do? This man is thinking he can do something good to impress Jesus, something good that will enable him to have. Whatever it is, I'll do it. As one writer puts it, perhaps he thinks that everyone has their price, even God. I just need to find out what it is. But Jesus will not let him off the hook too quickly. See, as Mark's gospel account of this incident makes clear, Jesus, looking at this man, loved him. And like a skillful surgeon, because he loved him, he has to isolate the cancer if there is any hope of removing it. And so Jesus exposes what this man's real problem is, step by step. Look at the commandments. Which ones? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honour your parents, love your neighbour as yourself. No problem. I've done them all. Self-sufficient, perhaps? Self-satisfied, do you think? Well, not quite. Notice the question. What do I still lack? He might have been scrupulous in his keeping of the law, or at least some of it, but he knows something's still missing. He's not satisfied. Eternal life is not his yet. And he knows it. What do I still lack? This is actually the point in Mark's Gospel where we're told that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. Jesus knew exactly what was lacking. He knew what kept this man captive and what would not let him go. He knew what the heart problem really was. This young man had been climbing the ladder of affluence and influence for some time now. We don't know the steps he took. Did it start with a little property purchase? Did he invest shrewdly? Did he just work really hard and live frugally and save like mad till he got to this point? Was it an inheritance or a gift? We just don't know. But however he had acquired the things he had, the truth was that they now had him rather than him having them. Jesus, because he loved him, brought this tragic truth out into the light of day. If you want to be complete, if you want to reach the goal, then go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And with those words, this man's whole world comes tumbling down. This cannot be just another acquisition Eternal life is not like that. It's not just one more thing to have. And unless he's willing to stop acquiring, stop having, and abandon everything to follow Jesus, it will be lost to him forever. 
See, the contrast between this man and the children is even starker, isn't it, now? Those with nothing to give and who could do nothing to achieve are welcomed and touched and prayed for. And this man, with so much, doing so much, went away grief-stricken. Why? Because he had many possessions. And at that moment, it was clear that he didn't have those many things. Those many things had him. The accumulation of things is a trap that we can all fall into. But the real difficulty is not the things, it's the heart. For that man did not have to go away sad, did he? He could have responded, all right, if that's what it takes, I'll give it all away. Didn't Zacchaeus say, I'm happy to give, I'm happy to return what I've taken? He could have said, that's what I'll do, it's worth it. They're just things anyway, aren't they? But he wouldn't. He just couldn't. It's amazing how strong a hold his things had on him and they would not let him go. Friends, our hearts are extraordinarily deceptive when it comes to wealth and possessions and how, they, how much of a hold they can have over us. I suspect that most of us here would never imagine it being a problem for us. Now, we don't have an inordinate ambition. We're not expecting a mansion, at least not in this life. A few of us have an investment portfolio to die for. But it's not really the quantity that is the issue. It's how we relate to what we have and how it changes the way we approach the things that really matter. See, wealth can change the way you think. Stepping onto the ladder of affluence, even just the bottom rung, can give you a false sense of control. There is all the difference in the world between an acquirer and a receiver. And in case you thought it was just this man's problem, Jesus turned to his disciples and generalised the lesson. How incredibly difficult it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The absurdity of thinking that you could fit a camel, one of the largest animals most people could see in Palestine, through the eye of a needle. Well, you know, my eyesight is getting so bad, I can't even see the hole in needles most of the time. But it's unimaginable, isn't it? It just can't be done. The love of money and possessions is insidious. It will tangle its way around your heart without you realising it, and it will take possession of you. The camel and the eye of a needle. It's not an image we should try to soften or water down in any way. Notice the shock reaction of the disciples. Then who can be saved? If that's what it's like, who can be saved? If on the one hand there is no way of achieving our salvation, the most scrupulous observance of the law is not enough, and if the things we have can become an insurmountable obstacle, the camel and the needle, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked straight at them and said, with man this is impossible. You're right, can't be done. With man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. There will be wealthy people in the kingdom but not because they're wealthy. Not even because they use their wealth for kingdom purposes. But because God is powerful and because God loves. He just loves. And so we're strangely brought back to where we began. Salvation is about what God has done. It is received, not achieved or acquired. It's not about what we do, but about what God has done and what God is doing. That was true of the children, brought to Jesus without any claim or record of achievement or ability to acquire, and Jesus said, let them come. It was true, tragically, in reverse of the rich young ruler. Coming to Jesus, seeking to acquire, seeking something to do, 
he was not willing to abandon it all and simply trust Jesus to walk in the bright light of a salvation and that was simply given. We can erect all kinds of barriers, construct all kinds of obstacles to genuine faith in Jesus. The disciples did that in the wake of the children brought to Jesus. They were not convinced those children fitted within the scope of Jesus' mission. And the rich young ruler did that when he was faced with the stark choice of holding on to control or abandoning himself to Jesus. For you see, faith is trust. To believe the promises of God is to trust the one who made those promises. To trust his character. To trust his power to bring something out of nothing and to rescue what looks lost. To trust his plan to give his people an inheritance that dwarfs anything this world can offer. It is to trust he has a plan a future for us so glorious that it makes every struggle in this life worthwhile. It is to trust his inversion of the world's values. The first will be last and the last will be first. Brothers and sisters, it is always a miracle when a person is saved. A helpless child, a young man so convinced he has everything under control, anyone. It's always a miracle. But God is very good at miracles. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder that salvation, our salvation, is entirely from you. Would you help us to learn deeply the lessons the disciples needed to learn that day in the wake of the children coming and the rich young man walking away? Please help us to have our trust firmly fixed in you, who you are, what you have done, and what you are doing. And we ask it of you for Jesus' sake. Amen.